Hello and welcome back to Quality Policing. It has been a while since I've made an episode of this, so I hope there's still someone out there to listen to this. Um, but I wanted to get back into doing this um, in part because um, I finally have a publication date for my book, which is February, March of next year. And I'd love to be interviewing some of the people in my book. And then I happened to read one of the most fabulous books I've read in a long time. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get in touch with this guy. And um, perhaps uh, this podcast is a great excuse to have a conversation about the book. Um, his name is Neil Gong. His book is Sons, Daughters, and Sidewalk Psychotics. Mental Illness and Homelessness in Los Angeles, and he is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego. Um, welcome. Welcome, Neil. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Peter. Like, um, like as I've mentioned, just as we were talking, like I've been teaching your material for a while, so it's really exciting to be here. Um, well, I I mean, I, I enjoyed um, your book for a lot of different reasons, um, and that's sort of what makes it all appeal to me. The subject matter is interesting. The research method is interesting. Um, the writing is good. Um, I mean, I should mention, so this this book is, um, in academic terms, it's an ethnography, as was my book, Cop in the Hood. And that just, I mean, it just means your research methods are you immerse yourself in your subject matter and talk to people. I'm sure I'm not doing ethnography justice, but that's basically what it is, right? Yeah, more or less. Um, so this is, and so I should also mention, because this generally is a policing podcast, this this episode will be policing adjacent um, because homelessness and mental illness very much is a police issue. But the book isn't specifically on um, policing. It is about uh, mental illness. It's about treatment of mental illness. And it's about the different kinds of treatment in mental illness between the rich and the poor. Um, so it's going to cover those issues. And um, I'm also just interested in writing issues as a fellow author. Um, and um, I hope, you know, along with people who might go, no, it's not about cops. Well, I don't know. You don't have to listen or you do. And hopefully some grad students uh, might listen in and be inspired um, in terms of research and writing uh, and certainly in buying the book. Who publishes the book? It was in Chicago? Chicago, yeah. University of Chicago Press. Who did you work with there? Uh, Elizabeth Branch Dyson. I, I, I first signed with Doug Mitchell um, uh, before. Sort of he... a legend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was great to get a chance to meet with and brainstorm with Doug. Um, but then he quickly retired and then unfortunately passed soon thereafter. But um, Elizabeth Branch Dyson was was really wonderful to work with. How did you get to that structure of the book? When did you realize or, you know, actually give me a timeline if you would, when your research was, but when did your book actually come together as a book? Because I know that's a big jump from being out there and just being immersed in life, basically. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the field work really starts around 2013, so like over a decade ago. And, you know, I was doing field work first with public safety and mental health in downtown Los Angeles. And then I kind of went across the proverbial tracks to elite private care for people who are, who are paying out of pocket, uh, you know, West LA and Malibu. And so really the field works 2013 to 2017 or so. And then I, you know, did some follow up here and there. Um, but it was initially going to be a, an academic book very much. And um, so I was in Chicago and I was thinking, you know, it's this great place for American urban ethnographies. That's kind of what they're known for. And they, at a certain point, suggested... Let me just interject, I mean, because we know this, but I mean, there's something called the Chicago School, and it's more that they're known for it. They're one of the founders of it, and they're still known for it. And great people, um, great sociologists and great ethnographers, I'm thinking of Mitch Dunier in particular, uh, but, you know, I've come out of University of Chicago and done this style of research in various subjects. Yeah, absolutely. So, so both the school itself, uh, then the press... You know, is known for this type of work, and but they've also made a series of these books that are these kind of crossovers, like um, uh, uh, these types of books that are academic, uh, but they're story driven. And so, at a certain point, um, Elizabeth suggested maybe that my book could be one of those. It's you know, it's timely, it's of the moment. I had a lot of stories, some of which are quite dramatic, um, and so you know, I turned the book in initially as more of this kind of academic book, but then they they asked me to reorient it and sort of maybe start more with stories. And then from there, try to figure out how to branch out into history and theory and the kind of more academic sides of things. And so it was it was quite a process. Yeah, the, the rewriting from dissertation to book and then from initial academic book to this kind of crossover one that they were going to market more towards a general audience. Took a long and time. And what was your, you, you mentioned a very nice in the um 
acknowledgements at the end. Uh, you mentioned uh, Stefan Timmerman, who I don't know. In fact, I mm. perhaps to my shame have, haven't heard of, or maybe I've forgotten. Um, but what was your relationship with your advisor like? Well, Stefan is a, is a fantastic advisor. So, you know, he's both known uh, for his own work as a medical sociologist, a number of very important books on on things like on, on CPR, on uh, you know genetic testing of of children, um, on uh, um, on trying to explain uh, mysterious deaths, so you know from a sort of coroner's office kind of ethnography. But he's also very well known for his methodological work on with with Ido Tavori of NYU on you know what they're calling abductive analysis, but trying to find something between the kind of extremes of the grounded theory inductive schools and, and what gets called, this is very inside baseball for ethnography, the, the extended case method, a very kind of deductive, like here, Mark said this thing, we're going to go see if it's true in the world. And Stefan and Ito have been working on just kind of sensitizing yourself by reading broadly, you know, across, of course, what you're studying, but also across different areas. And then just trying to figure out, um, you know, what's surprising in the field and what doesn't line up with a bunch of existing theories and then trying to sort of work from there. Um, so that's, yeah, Steph, but Stefan's also just known at UCLA and around as, as a fantastic mentor. He gave me so much time. And now that I'm actually, a, you know, directing graduate students myself, I see, I see how time intensive and special that is. So how did you avoid falling into ideological traps? I mean, there are correct answers to if you give me a question i you know about policing i can tell you what and not me personally because i've kind of never fallen into these traps but uh you know i can tell you what the correct answer is supposed to be about race issues about police issues about homeless and about mental illness and when i started reading your book of course i expected to be able to pigeonhole you and you know at times like ah look at that language clearly he's one of them and then you know three pages later i was like no no actually i just gotta relax and um take this for what it is this is a real um that you're you're you've done the you know the shoe leather research but it's clear that you're not trying to bullshit the reader who hasn't who doesn't know as much as you and that's why we're reading this book um did you was this a conscious effort or is it just like, hey, I just call it like I see it? Yeah, I mean, I think to some degree it was, I, you know, at various times I had, you know, so, so on some of these issues, the most controversial issues in, you know, mental health care being things like, uh, you know, when uh, or if or when, you know, when we should force people into treatment. Uh, that's one of the big ones. Should we bring back the asylum? These kinds of questions. Is there a role for for police in mental health response, or should it be completely outside of uh, of the policing system or the 911 system itself? And maybe you have these complete alternatives. And these are a lot of the, the kind of current controversies um, is, you know, can we explain homelessness via mental health and addiction, or is it primarily like a structural housing market issue? Like these, these kinds of things. And, and it's true, people tend to have very ideological responses to it. I would say, you know, I at various times have had what were my initial commitments and then just having seen enough, like I had to rethink them. So for instance, like, you know, I, I know people who have been put on psychiatric holds and found them very traumatizing and that, and that put me into kind of a more of a strict civil libertarian mindset. But I also met people through the research, which also just in life who thought it saved their life at the same time that they think they think there could be massive improvements within those kinds of systems. Um, and so I think partly what the opportunity we get as ethnographers is to really try to see things from a lot of people's perspectives and and really take them seriously. And so, you know, um, okay, there was this sort of issue of the, the like as I mentioned, the grounded theory. Kind of you you show up with no preconceptions. I mean, I think that's impossible. Um, but it was very useful for me to show up with my preconceptions, but try to be aware of them and then and then let them be challenged. Um, and that could be. I could just let me just uh, give a quick definition sure. of grounded theory. Um, because technically my book was too. Uh, it's a, you know, 25 cent term for not having a research hypothesis going into your research. Um, it's convenient if you, I mean, my, I, I, I didn't know I wrote an ethnography. This, I'm, this sounds naive, but I'm telling you it's the truth until my book came out and Mitch Dunier told me I had written a great ethnography. Um, I really, I did not have many preconceived notions. I didn't know the police role. Um, and so that approach of just sort of, and again, no, of course I had some, I mean, I had done police research in Amsterdam, so I, I wasn't, but um, that is called grounded theory. It's just a fancy term. 
and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm a long time out of grad school, and I'm, uh, is just a, it basically means research without trying to prove or disprove a hypothesis. Is that correct? I, I, yeah, I think that's, yeah, certainly for a, for a, for a non-expert audience, yeah, that's fine. And I'd say even for an expert audience, that gets you most of the way there. Yeah. Okay. Um, cause I don't want to lose people in academic terms. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so let, let, let we get, let's, so let's get into the nitty gritty of your book. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you want to just summarize it? Like, I don't sure. know. What do you see as the yeah, main Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can just try to do a, a quick and dirty version. So and again, this is Sons, Daughters, and Sidewalk Psychotics. Yeah, so the basic conceit of the book is that, you know, since the deinstitutionalization of serious mental illness, since the United States closed a lot of its state mental hospitals, uh, since there was a civil libertarian turn in mental health law that gave patients new rights, often to refuse treatment, um, we've talked about this thing that was supposed to replace it called community care, like we're moving people into treatment in the community. And the basic conceit of the book is that there's not just one community care, like we have different community cares for different communities. And for some reason, most of our research has not really addressed this, right, that there's there's massive inequality. And so what I did for the book is I is I embedded with like a L.A. County Department of Mental Health case management team. So this is a kind of treatment provider for for people who who lack resources. We're often uh, homeless. And then I looked at that public safety net in comparison with, and I kind of went across uh, town to see elite private care. And um, part of the, the punchline of the book is it's not necessarily obvious that what, how the differences work. Um, you know, there are problems in each setting. And, and some of the things I end up finding, I think are, are kind of, uh, uh, they surprised me. I'll say. And so, well, and I, and um, I'm, you know, one of those things which surprised me is you present a very convincing argument that, um, that rich people in this system, the system that they go into have less freedom sort of in quotes here, because there's a question of what that means, but ignoring that important issue that rich people have less freedom um, than poor people in their system. And that, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing, um, but there, you can, put restrictions, the private expensive systems have more restrictions in many ways than, than the public. Yeah. System. Yeah. Yeah. And I can try to explain that a little bit. So I, I think we, we often assume, and this was sort of one of my assumptions at one point that, you know, uh, in, in kind of public safety net, uh, poor people's treatment, it's going to be, you know, very harsh. There's going to be all these behavioral demands upon people. This is kind of the image we get uh, I think both sort of our, our common sense of, you know, the poor being dominated by, say, like a, um, a state agency or something. Um, and what I found is that it just wasn't true, uh, in part because it's a resources issue, right? So, like, if you go to a treatment home for poor people with serious mental health issues, there might be all these rules saying things like, you know, you can't drink here. Uh, you're going to have to take your meds. We're going to need you to do these activities. But they just don't have enough staff. So, you know, um, like people are openly getting high in some of these places. Um, people wander out during the day and who knows what they do. Um, we have that. You also have kind of this uh, this change towards what's it's called the housing first model. So the idea being that you would get homeless people uh, uh, into housing immediately to try to stabilize their situation and you wouldn't have behavioral demands like uh, sobriety or psychiatric treatment compliance with a doctor's orders. Um, which in some ways is, is is shown to be an effective way to at least begin to stabilize someone's situation. And then you're supposed to bring all of these wraparound services. But again, this is as a resource issue that those wraparound services don't always exist. So you might place a person with serious mental illness and addiction into uh, an apartment and then someone's supposed to visit them and it doesn't necessarily happen on time. On the other hand, I think a lot of us have this assumption that wealthy people just get to do whatever they want. I mean, oftentimes this is true. This is how we think about what wealth buys you. But in this context, it's usually families who are paying top dollar to have their say adult son or daughter who's experiencing psychiatric issues or addiction uh, monitored. And here you actually have the resources to do so. So if you go to a high-end treatment home in West LA, you know there, there actually is a schedule and there is staff to watch people and Sometimes people. And how much do those cost? Some of these figures are amazing. Yeah, you know, so it, it, there's a range. So you know, for a sober living home, so that's like a you know a place to stay in the community that has some oversight. You know, that might be four k a month, but that's not with a ton of treatment. Um, 
if you're it's looking still at still 48,000 a year, I mean, that's, yeah. you know, Oh, that's, that's quite a bit. Um, but then when yeah. you're looking into the residential treatment programs, dual diagnosis, so mental illness and chemical addiction. And if you're looking in, in places like Malibu, they could be 30 to $60,000 a month. These are the kind of places that in many cases, uh, you know, will not directly accept insurance. You can try to get, you know, you can try to take the bill and get your insurance to cover some of it. But in, in many cases, what's happening is families who are maybe upper middle class, not necessarily super wealthy, uh, are in crisis, are pulling together all the money they can to try to put their loved one in for, for a couple of months to see if they can sort of turn the situation around. And so, yeah, I mean, these are, this is, people go through their savings trying to pay for these. Um, the, the interesting thing about the, the, the multi-tiered system of mental health is that private insurance for the middle class tends to be pretty bad. Like what people figure out pretty quickly is if you're talking about serious mental illness, like a schizophrenia diagnosis, your private insurer probably won't offer much. In many cases, it's actually going to be better to go into the public sector and try to get access to some of the resources there, which will be sort of less therapeutic, but you might have kind of social workers and case management to, to help with Keep, you know, keeping people out of jail or like finding people housing. But then there's this other private system, which is for the people who are paying yeah, directly uh, uh, to these kinds of providers. So it's sort of like a three-tiered system in that way. So I know it's always sort of fraught when you start to overlap, um, or if I want to sound like an academic, I could say the intersection of, of mental illness and homelessness, um, because they can be separate. Uh, but are you... Could you, how does, a lot of your work was done on Skid Row in LA. Um, what is that intersection between mental illness and homelessness? Is it something that we could, that money's going to solve the problem or, or not even, let's not say solve, but it gives it going to make things better. Like how much of it's money, how much of it is laws, how much of it is apathy? Ooh, yeah, it's... <laughs> It's all it's kind of all of the above at different points. So, yeah, I mean, I think the the in broad strokes, I'd say, right, the housing and homelessness crisis in California is primarily that like we don't have enough housing stock. And so, uh, you know, we have a long history there. If you want to try to understand that, where, you know, you have a lot of nimbyism, people have you know fought to prevent the construction of uh, affordable housing or just like multifamily housing, like people have stopped just apartment buildings in certain neighborhoods. And so part of it's just a supply and demand issue. Um, at the same time, you know, so I think for a lot of people, the idea would be if there was affordable housing available, even if they are experiencing mental illness or addiction, a lot of people would be able to move inside and with the right support services do completely fine. Um, that I would say is really the, the majority. But you do have some people where even when they are offered this kind of uh, housing first model, where they're, you know, given an apartment. So some people will just straight up refuse it. This is a small percentage we're talking about. And then uh, others will, even with, you know, some support services uh, um, will eventually end up back on the street or incarcerated or what have you. And so, I mean, the the research we have on the Housing First model suggests that about, you know, 85% of people, even with dual diagnosis, so mental illness and chemical addiction, if they're given the apartment and support staff, 85% will will stay housing stable. Um, that's There's a different question about, you know, how well they do in terms of the health outcomes, but at least they'll they'll stay inside. Um, but you are going to have this some remainder of people who, even if you had the appropriate housing stock, um, may may remain outdoors. Or you know, I talk about one woman in my book who was offered housing, but she was convinced that God told her to live near the church, so she decided she was going to choose to live near the church. It's a very small percentage of people, but that that kind of thing can happen. But you also you make the the good point that um, in the public system, the goal often is benign containment, um, which is basically don't get arrested and don't, um, well, there's an anecdote you give, and I forget the total context, but the solution was, could you please bang on the wall, bang your head against the oh, wall yes. that is not yeah. uh, the shared wall <laughs> with your neighbor, um, which is a low bar, but at some point that matters and talk about, you need landlords that are willing to rent to people who are objectively bad tenants you know that you don't want to live yeah. next to so that kind of limits the choices but on the other but then the goal for people with money often is social respectability and having junior like successfully graduate college and get some nepotistic job so they can you know so people don't whisper well they're yeah. still going to whisper behind their back is the irony but so so they can pretend that everything's fine normal act normal yeah yeah um and there are very different goals in that um 
did I, did I, did I summarize that right? Yeah, you did, yeah, yeah. I'll just give a little context. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, so the phrase I use is tolerant containment, um, or as you just said, it's kind of, yeah, this kind of benign containment. The idea, the goal for the public mental health system is basically like, keep the person off the street, keep them out of jail, keep them from triggering too many 911 calls. And that's that's basically success. And so that means things like, if we can keep you in the apartment and you smoke your crack in there, um, or or you or you talk to yourself in there, but you don't risk eviction, then hey, that's that's much better than the alternative in many cases. And, and so this... A particular anecdote um, was a woman was banging her head on the wall she shared with her neighbor, and he's paying market rate in LA. He's very upset. And so I went with a social worker, and they're trying to figure out, like, what can we do here? Because it's not like they have the time to monitor her all the time or put her through some intensive behavioral therapy. They can't force her on a medication. And so what they come up with is banging your head on the wall that goes out to the street. And it, you know, at least it's a way to keep her from from ending up back on the street. And, and as you said, it, it requires certain kinds of landlords. It's a whole ecosystem. And so, in, in some of the instances I'm talking about, there were these uh, uh, Koreatown kind of slum wards, but benevolent slum wards. Uh, these immigrants who were trying to find a way to kind of climb the class ladder, and and they figure out a way to work with the county and take a lot of difficult residents. And so there's yeah there's a, a there's a whole ecosystem there that that that's oriented to that and then on the other hand for the elite clinics yeah you know if families are paying all this money um because they love their adult child or sister or whatever but also there's a respectability issue and for them you know having having your loved one you know smoke crack in the other room or bang their head on the other wall is that's not really what they're looking for um you know, oftentimes they they have an idea of respectability, as you said. So that might be someone going back to college and finishing college after a psychotic break, or you know, at least having a hobby, or at least being normalized enough that they can come to family dinner without causing too much trouble. Yeah, it's a very mm -hmm. different set of goals, and and with these goals, right, with housing versus normalization, you end up with different kinds of of tools of social control. And so if the if the bar is really low, in on the one hand, this is how you end up with a public system that gives people a lot of individual freedom. To be strange. Uh, on the other hand, you end up with this kind of more constraining system for the privileged. Um, and so the irony being that you might be, you know, your family might be pushing you into what seems like the best care money can buy, but people can themselves feel very, very controlled in a way that you might not if you were a poor person. Hmm. Let me focus more on the, the poor side of the equation only because personally, um, I do have a pretty good friend who, by the way, was involuntarily committed and um, is very appreciative of that fact. Um, so, I mean, but that's, you know, one person. Uh, but let me focus on the, I mean, I, I live in New York City. Um, the other day I'm leaving the subway at 42nd Street and there's a man sprawled out of the top of the staircase, literally twitching. And um, I walk around him and continue on my day and feel bad uh, that I've been dehumanized to that extent that I have to leave this guy who seemed to be on some substance and uh you know he was up on drugs and i assume has mental illnesses as well but i don't know hell i don't even know if he's homeless right um but i think i can what i'm assuming but he is um what can and should be done with that person i, I know i can just sort of hear some strawman argument of some progressive going oh does his discomfort make you feel bad well actually yeah it does um, because I'm a human being and I feel that, um, this guy, it's inhumane to leave him there, but I also know that, right. He's not hurting anybody. Uh, and I find that a weird, I find that in a, an immoral concept of freedom that this is his right. I don't know if he would decline services, but I kind of assume that the service, I mean, by definition, the service resistant homeless population has declined services. Um, what's the answer there? Do we just, should I just ignore it and move on or like yeah. a society you're 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 you know mayor police chief and uh, a trained social worker now yeah so i would say first of all i do want to highlight as you said right it's not just dehumanizing to that person but it's dehumanizing to you uh, as a member of the community who has to get used to this idea of i just walk by people's suffering and and have become sort of immune to it because we just see it every day so you know what do we do so so one thing is i i certainly met people on the streets who who would if they were offered the kind of subsidized housing plus uh, uh wraparound services take it and there's plenty of people who haven't been uh, in part because they kind of haven't 
hit the low enough uh, 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 um, uh, level where they would be considered the kind of public problem for whom we would prioritize these services. So I think there are a lot of people who we think need, perhaps need forced treatment, who if we had access to high quality housing with wraparound services for them, um, they would do it voluntarily. Uh, there are other people for whom if we'd reached them five years ago or 10 years ago, we probably could have gotten them onto these kind of voluntary services. I also met a lot of people I, and, and uh, where they had really bad experiences of being burned, promised things, and then it fell through. And so I, I'm just trying to, to acknowledge that there are reasons why people are, are, are treatment resistant. And then and the third one being that I meet people who have been through forced treatment and it was awful. Um, in many cases, yeah, they, they were never offered that original high quality voluntary care. They sort of fall through the cracks, eventually end up uh, uh, on a psychiatric hold or, or getting psychiatric services after being arrested, something like this. And so I think we can say all those things are true. Um, at the same time, there are some people that if we don't have some sort of more coercive intervention, they might die on the streets and or they're, they're causing a lot of trouble for, for the community. And so I think to me, one of the points I try to make in the book is that we, we get locked into these sort of yes, no civil liberties debates. And those are important, but I also think it's really important that we, if we're, you know, if we're going to have more forced treatment, like how do you do it well? And that somehow never gets, never gets discussed in, in, in any kind of in-depth way. Um, I do often feel the focus is yeah misplaced where there's a certain type of advocate who wants that person seen by as many people as possible, which I feel is very exploitive. Um, and then often that leads to fun. So make me less cynical or at least less conspiratorial because I'm not naturally a conspiracy kind of guy. And I know also, I mean, every city is different. I, you know, I'm in a New York and I know more about the New York system and this is not my field, keep in mind. So, you know. Um, your research was in LA. I assume you know more about this in a lot of places because it is your field. Um, I am very cynical about, you know, for lack of a better term, the homeless industrial complex. And I mm -hmm. see, and, you know, I don't want to paint it with too broad a brush because there's a lot of variety, I'm sure. But there are people who are profiting from other people's misery. And in New York in particular, there has been, you know, along with straight up corruption. I mean, I'm not even talking about the illegal kind, which is out there. Um, but um, lack of incentive basically to solve the problem because places are paid by bodies in beds. And if they get those bodies into better beds, then they don't get the payment for that person. Um, and it's purely seen, you know, the profit driven motive because all these things are given out to NGOs and, and um, sure. um, I, I, I would be, you know, it, it, it means when there's a problem, the government can say, look, it's not our scandal, but um, I would prefer it almost to be the government scandal because then it's there's more accountability and fixing things. Maybe the actual question is this, like how does a city, New York City spends literally billions on homelessness directly and then more, many more billions on social services in general. But it's a, um, this is why I get so frustrated with police defunders because the it's, this is off the top of my head, but it's something close to $3 billion a year on homelessness. The police budget is around $6 billion. Um, at least I know what I'm getting for with the six billion. Um, I don't believe that if we just took a billion from cops and gave it to homeless services, suddenly all the problems would be better. And also, just for perspective, the New York City budget is about 110 billion. So we're, you know, mm. um, uh, but so the, the cost per person is we're talking tens of thousands of dollars per person. I don't think LA spends that much, but San Francisco has the same issue. And a lot of people, myself included, say, where the hell is this money going? Like, I yeah. I would love to help people, but at some level, yes, I do. I, I also don't want to see the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let me tackle this, tackle this in a few ways. So so one, you know, as far as the, you know, is it is it a conspiracy? Are there people who are profiting off of other people's misery? Like, certainly. I mean, I think this is a, a bigger problem of when you've had such a fracturing of social services where you have like a million nonprofits. And I met plenty of people who working in nonprofits who were, who were good faith actors. Um, but there is just like... It's not well integrated. Uh, I would opt also prefer to have a more centralized system. And I, I actually would just like to see a lot of just done more directly by by county governments, um, perhaps by by states. Uh, it, it is highly fragile. bringing back the asylum. Yeah. There's that. And there's that as a component. 
Um, as far as like, yeah, the spending on homelessness, it's true. Like, you know, like just the shelter system in New York, yeah, like around $3 billion uh, to maintain homelessness, right? Not to end it. And in LA, there was a big campaign. Um, Ezra Klein has done good coverage on this where it's like, we're going to spend all this bond measure money to create real permanent supportive housing. So we're not just managing homelessness, we're actually ending it. But for all the reasons I, I mentioned before, in terms of why it's so difficult to build in California, the NIMBYism, also, uh, you know, strong environmental protections, which delay construction. I mean, all, you know, the, that, that latter one, like, I think there's a place for it, but it also gets weaponized by the NIMBYs. So it went from constructing each unit of permanent housing, the estimates were around 300,000. By the time they were actually finished, it was like 600,000 because just so many layers and so much time and people taking their cut. And so some of that's just about the problems with our, with our housing markets. Um, and so that's certainly one of the ways that all of this money that you think is going towards sort of solving homelessness, it just sort of ends up uh, maybe getting half of your bang for your buck. So, so there's that. Uh, you know, as far as the conspiracy, like I said, I think there's there are some people who, who are bad actors in this. Um, but for the most part, I, I, people I met on the street were trying to do what they could. Um, but it's just it's kind of this big mess. Well, the people on the street are trying to do what they could. But is the person who is applying for the government contract? That's the one I'm sure. more worried about. You yeah. know, they have to hire people who at some level, I think, care. But it's the at organizational level. What about um, I say so some of this? I find in a way, most of it is not simple. Some of it is like people, um, New York has an anti-camping law. Um, people wonder why we don't have people sleeping in tents. It's because we don't permit it. Um, it. And there's, you know, move to change that. And I, boy, I hope it doesn't. Um, we could allow tents in Central Park. Uh, we don't. Um, do you have a position on that? Like what I, I've, I, it works. In, of course, New York does have also has a right to shelter, which is another issue. Uh, people. But what do you think about basic sort of like, let, let me phrase it in a broader way. Sure. Um, I often find it odd when people assume that, and this could apply to criminals, it could apply to homelessness, it could apply to people with mental illness or addicts. Um, there's a sort of, or sometimes it's applied just to poor people, or they don't have any agency, basically, is what it comes down to. Um I find that well, along with being patronizing, I just find it wrong. Like there's also, you know, New York a couple of years ago made it legal to shoot up in public and now people are shooting up in public. Um, there's another problem that I don't know what the solution is, but I'd like it swept under the rug. Uh, I, I don't know what the answer to the addiction is, but I would prefer you not shooting up in public. And that's a choice. Um, how, you know, these are sort of broad quality of life issues. Um, I don't know if you just want to like expound on that or the, I mean, cause you've got competing interests of the community. Like here's another thing is I'm support in theory, like any NIMBY, the concept of a homeless shelter, damn right. I don't want to live next to one because some of the people in there are going to be a pain in the ass. Like, what well, am I just supposed to go? Okay. Small price to pay. I mean, maybe the answer is yes, but I don't know. What... Yeah. Uh, these are hard ones, right? Yeah. So I think with that last one, right. So the argument I hear sometimes is, to the NIMBY in LA, right? It's like, no, oh, these people are already here. They're already camped outside. And so if you don't want them camped outside, and this is the logic behind, you know, we have this uh, uh, Grants Pass case that we'll get a ruling on from the Supreme Court soon. Um, you know, can you displace people or find them or, 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 you know, penalize them in various ways if there isn't shelter? Uh, and the, the argument right now at least has been like, that would be cruel and unusual punishment. That was the Martin v. Boise decision, you know, in, in the Ninth Circuit. And so I think if you want to get around that, right, like in, in an L.A. type setting, the argument would be like you're going to have to put up with a homeless shelter near you or a lot more, uh, you know, um, multifamily housing, uh, building like a lot of apartment buildings, uh, affordable housing of various sorts. Yeah. I, so I think that one one way that I, I maybe differ from some of the the kind of party line of, of some progressives here, and as you saw in the book, is that. I'm trying to take seriously like that this is a big impact on the community when people when there are open air drug markets, right? When everyone's camped out. Um, and I certainly would like to see some big kind of structural changes in terms of, you know, our, our ability to deliver people high quality mental health and addiction services way earlier in their trajectories, as well as affordable housing and all these kinds of things. But in the absence of that or sort of in the meantime, yeah, it creates a lot of havoc uh, in some of these in some of these types of areas. And so, 
So to my mind, this is also with the forced treatment issue. I mean, of course, these different subtleties for the different ones. So much of the, the moral calculus for me kind of hinges on like what it is you're giving people. So if we had if we had good shelters with good services, uh, do I think, we, you know, it, it makes sense to kind of push people into them? Yeah. If there are scary places where people are genuinely scared that they're going to be assaulted, I, I understand why they would prefer to camp outside. I mean, same thing with forced psychiatric treatment, like. You know, I've I've heard real horror stories about some of these people's experiences. If we had really high quality mental hospitals um, that were well designed, that were judicious about you know not not just like slamming someone with an injection of antipsychotics that that makes their whole body twinge for a week, right? Like, if we were able to deliver something good, I think there's absolutely a moral argument and a practical argument for for being able to uh, uh, have a more forceful approach. Well, that brings to mind. Um... Greg Berman and um, Aubrey Fox wrote a book called Incremental. It's not called, maybe it is called, I forget what it's called, but it's about incrementalism. And that might be the title. It's a good book. Um, and this whole idea that because I'm outraged because here's an example of something gone wrong and then people want to basically destroy the system. I mean, it happened with state asylums. You saw it with anti-police protests. And it, I mean, now, you know, on the other hand, you see it now with, oh, look, this you know, here's somebody who committed a crime and he crossed the border from Mexico. Therefore, all immigrants are bad. Like you see it on both sides of the spectrum, of the political spectrum. But um, there, it's so it's a way it's so simplistic. Like, well, yeah, a good shelter. It's not easy to do a good shelter because there are people in it that have serious problems. But um, of course, we need better shelters. You know, we need better jails and prisons. You know, we need better. We need better everything. Um, but it's a whole different framework to look at it that way and just say, well, yeah, if, you know, we do need some asylum. It doesn't have to be horrible. We're not going to go back to the 1950s um, and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I mean, I, how many, you know, how many decades, lifetimes, generations later, and that movie is still used as an argument against the asylum. And I kind of go, you know, it's before I was born. Um, the, so you get... But it's not. It's, it's tougher to talk about that. And here's the other problem: is is even in in your better shelter, there will be some scandal, and then of course people will blame blame the system. I, I also, I guess, I get frustrated because a lot of the people, you know, there's also there was a push to get police out of the shelter system. Like once you get ideology involved, um, it's a problem because now the shelters are less safe. Uh, and I don't want my policy positions on homelessness intertwine with ideological position that all cops are bastards um you know public safety it's important and shelter safety is important i don't know i guess I, I, yeah your book seems very willing and you to you know we need the hard work in just making things better which i don't know if that's <laughs> simple or profound it, i think it's yeah yeah absolutely like right? it's 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 uh a, a lot of the kind of ideas that I have, like in the sort of policy section conclusion, are are attempts at at pragmatic compromise. Like, where can we go from here? And and there are times that I I really appreciate when I when I talk to to people who have a kind of utopian vision of the future. Um, it's like, yeah, like how can we work to there? But the question for me is always like, what like what does a transition look like? Uh, also, we might never be able to get there. In which case, like in the in that transition, we'll have to come up with some sort of balance point for a lot of these types of things. And so like, just to give one example of of, uh, of one of these kinds of compromises in incrementalism, um, although I think it's a little more interesting than just kind of like we meet in the middle, is like around the forced treatment issue. Uh, one of the things that's always been- interesting really where the rubber hits the road. I mean, forced treatment yeah. is kind of, that's what it's about. I'm gonna make you do something you're not choosing to do. Yeah, uh, one of the things that's been interesting to me is that I would talk to <clears throat> advocates sort of on each side. So you talk to patients, who have gone through really terrible things and they give you all these reasons why, you know, like th their forced treatment went wrong and it was this big violation of their autonomy. And, 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 and again, because some of these side effects from things like antipsychotic medication, like it are, they're very real. Um, they can, they can alter someone's physical health and mental health forever. Um, I would sort of be convinced by what they were saying. And I would talk on the other side to sometimes family members or policy makers who were like, clearly we, we need to do something about people who are either dying on the street or creating havoc in their families or in their communities. And to me, the idea, one of the ideas I expound on in the book, and this is sort of in collaboration with Alex Barnard, who's a sociologist at NYU that, that, I, that, I, that I write with. One of our ideas is like, <clears throat> well, 
we should have, we're going to need some more of these kinds of forced treatment settings, but the people we should have collaborate to design it are the people who have already been through it and can tell us why it so often is terrible, right? So like, it's actually is a compromise that no one else was looking for, right? In the sense that the, a lot of the patient advocates are actually abolitionists. And my message to them is something like, look, this is coming. Like it's happening. These things are going to get built. So let's have your input into it. And I, I'm imagining things like, you know, you, uh, architects who have been placed on 5150 emergency psychiatric holds and have been through like, I mean, some of, I've been in some of these psych units and, and they're scary. You know, like, can we have a balance point between security on the ward, but also a sense of healing and so that it's not terrifying when people are at their most vulnerable? Um, how can we do sort of better procedural justice so that when people are going through a court hearing about whether they're going to lose their rights, can we actually make sure that they're listened to so that some of their preferences are, are still included in the court order, even if the maybe the main one of like, you're going to have to live in this unit um, uh, is they're overridden, but other aspects of what they want are incorporated in. So that's the kind of thing I, I'm looking at. Like, and like you said, it's not that sexy to say like, yeah, let's have incremental reform or like, we'll let these people design this aspect and these ones design this other aspect. But I think that's a, where a lot of the hard work is going to have to come. How do you get these institutions focused on actual treatment and cure, not a, even if not a total cure. I, I guess part of the problem now is you get up some involuntary commitment, you get a 48 or 72 hour hold on someone, but the hospital doesn't want that person there. They're not mm -hmm. interested. They just want to stabilize that person and get them out of the building as quickly as possible. Um, I, I mean, again, I, I don't really know for sure, but I, kind of see that as a major problem like there's actually nobody trying yeah. to help this person um and if the if once the you know it's once we made that step of taking away someone's freedom i need that other organization then to say yes this is our job um how can you improve that mentality in the in the healthcare system yeah so so one thing again is 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 again there's so much fracturing so between the oftentimes the hospitals are barely in communication with say a community treatment team that's doing the you know the home visits and helping support someone once they're either in a, living in a treatment home or or in their own private home and, and HIPAA so, laws you mentioned is are an obstacle here too because yeah. even family that wants to help yeah. they can't get information yeah yeah so th th that's uh, yeah you know, there's a lot of challenges in there and there are good reasons for a lot of these HIPAA laws right and 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 so trying to stitch this stuff together in a more pragmatic way is, is, is going to be complicated. Um, but like at least some countries, my understanding is that their, their hospital systems versus their community care systems are much better integrated. So it's things like that. Um, like you said, too often what we do with emergency hospitalizations is we just barely stabilize someone, we kick them back to the street, and then it's kind of like, wow, we took away someone's rights to not actually help them. Um, so it might actually mean sometimes it's going to mean longer holds, right? Sometimes that will mean better care. Also, of course, we have to watch out because the longer holds that we think of as better care can perhaps turn into this kind of uh, um, unnecessary detention. So we're going to have to also have like a lot of, we're also going to have like, a, you know, like oh, we're going to have to regulate these things well or have, you know, investigations from time to time. It's, it's going to require like that level of both kind of, um, yeah, the expansion of services, but also watching out because they're not, it's not, it, it's not always a simple good or bad when it comes to these kinds of things. Right. Uh, just, do you know the answer to this? What percent of homelessness in LA um, are from LA? And I don't mean last address being a homeless shelter in New York, which is sometimes how that figure is fudged. Yeah. You know, actually, I don't know. You know, sometimes you see these studies come out and they exactly like they say that most of these people, um, you know, they were they were housed before they were homeless. They didn't just come for homeless services or something to that effect or for the weather, but I'm not sure I trust uh, uh, the stuff I've seen there. So I'm not totally sure. So I, I won't even give a number. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't, I, I definitely don't trust those numbers I've seen in large part because all they have to do is say that their last address was a homeless shelter there. Uh, but it seems rather important to know, I mean, like data collection, I mean, there's tons in the criminal justice field. Um, how many people were shot last year? seems like an important question, and it's actually very hard to get accurate data on that in America. Um, so yeah, because I mean, I do think yeah, one of the things, we, you know, maybe I think cer certain cities are magnets. Um, I noticed uh, there was an influx to New York of people from Pennsylvania who um, it was just visible on the street through skin color and accent, um, people coming here for 
drug treatment services because New York does have some of that. And while I support drug treatment services, I don't know if I want to be the home for a bunch of addicts from central Pennsylvania. Uh, and again, that's because we localize these issues. Let me ask, are there any city, and you can pick and choose one or all, but um, is there a country that does this right that we could use as an example? Is there a city, I mean, like Houston often comes up in terms of housing, and I've never been to Houston. Is there, ooh, hmm. yeah, where's so, the so success we, I we mean, can follow Yeah, I mean, it's like one of these things where, you know, you can have some aspects better, but you're just gonna end up with different problems. So like, so Houston, is known for having done housing first very well, right? Like they got a lot of people into apartments and then stabilized their housing, but it's also because there's more affordable housing stock in part because they don't have the kind of zoning we have in places like California. And so it's easier to build and that's often good, right? But then you also hear these stories. There's a famous picture of a, uh, of a house and then someone like built a Ferris wheel next to it, right? It's like, um, so this is what you ha happens when you don't have uh, uh, some of these kind of zoning things in place is that you could think you have your nice residential zone and then suddenly like it's an amusement park. Um, so yeah, so Houston didn't really do anything magic at the, at the housing and homeless services level. It's just that there's a lot more affordable housing stock than there is in a place like, like California. As far as the, you know, the, the mental illness side, is there a country that sort of gets it right? I mean, this is, again, it ends up being a sort of balancing point issue. So, so countries with, National Health Services, um, you, know, you may better integrate their their hospitals and their community care. Um, but, you know, like from my understanding from talking to people who, who work on these issues in Europe is that they often will force someone into care at a lower threshold. If you're focused on the not having people suffering visibly on the street side, that's great. If you're looking at it from the sort of patient's rights perspective, there, there are activists who say, hey, in some ways, it's going to be better to be in the U.S. where you'll have more of your autonomy respected. So it sort of depends on what you're what you're looking for there. Yeah. What about uh, differences in approach to harm reduction? Europe versus the US. Yeah, I have yeah, some yeah, opinions yeah. on this, but I'm curious, <laughs> without without being too leading, what you have to say about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, that too much harm reduction in the US becomes what I call tolerant containment, right? So like you might have harm reduction as this kind of philosophy of, of, of trying to you know maximize people's autonomy while reducing harm. But what it often ends up looking like is we sort of say, we're not gonna arrest you. And so, yeah, you can shoot up in public, um, you know, here's a subsidized apartment and do whatever you do in there, in part because I think it's cheaper, right? So like if you have this kind of harm reduction philosophy but you don't have the kind of health services in place, it really does end up looking like a kind of kind of neglect or, or what I call tolerant containment. We're just trying to keep it somewhat out of view and not even that out of, out of view. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's much containment there, especially if it's in public transportation or, you know, main areas yeah. of the city. Yeah. Um, I, cause yeah, harm reduction, I think in, in America and stop me if you disagree. Um, but you know, it's been, I think just kidnapped by a certain sort of fringe of I mean, you're you're not allowed to shoot up and be homeless in European cities, um, and of course, that's not to say there's none of it. But it's yeah, you see the 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 threshold is much lower, and where where the state kicks in and says no, you just we don't yeah. permit that. Um, oh, and but they that also goes, have something to offer someone in terms of health. Yeah, and that goes along with social services. Yeah. Um, but we've only adopted the carrot part, and yet, but also like oh, but you don't have to follow any rules. Um. I mean, some of it, and I know it's a little simplistic to say people don't like shelters because of rules, but I mean, there's some, I'm using that as shorthand a little bit, but I mean, there's partly that, well, you want, uh, you want to do things that aren't permitted. Some of those are, you know, legitimate, uh, be there with a, you know, partner or pet or whatever, but others are just, sorry, but we have, this is in society, we all follow rules. We're all tools to some extent. I don't know why they wouldn't apply to you just because you're poor, um, or mentally ill or addicted. Um, but it's it bothers me that oh how harm reduction is done in America because it's not a bad concept it's just we don't do it and we kind of yeah. I think give it a yeah. bad term a bad no, it, should be, it should be one one leg of the stool of public health right so like if we're talking about addiction that should be both kind of like upstream social interventions where we're trying to you know strengthen communities it's also access to rehab but then it's also going to include clean needles and harm reduction services, right? That, uh, but if you're just going to have the harm reduction component without access to high quality healthcare, 
yeah, I, I mean, that does look like abandonment. And and part of part of the shtick in, in my book is I, I use the history of deinstitutionalization as a way to think through what we've done in these other cases. And so deinstitutionalization in the U.S. is kind of this moment where you have civil libertarians saying, like, close these terrible hospitals, let's give patients rights. On the other hand, you have uh, fiscal conservatives who are like, great, like, let's not pay for these, these, these state hospitals. And you get this kind of strange bedfellows coalition, but it's very American. It's very, it's the two sides of libertarianism, right? Like, let's not pay taxes and let's let people do whatever they want. Um, and that's kind of a disaster with psychiatric care. And I think we've done very similar things when it comes to drug decriminalization. Um, so whether that's in Oregon or in California with Prop 47, where we take you know, meth and heroin possession and say, well, this is going to be a misdemeanor. We're going to release people from prison and give them, uh, uh, you know, addiction services. But what we did is we released people from prison and didn't give them addiction services. Uh, and so what that ends up looking like is people end up homeless and back on drugs. Uh, it's again, I think it's a very kind of it's this funny compromise that makes a lot of sense if you think about the libertarian streak in American culture. Mm. So given the world we have and not the one we want, um, what is the role of policing on Skid Row, say, in L.A.? Um, how do you, because some of this also is, if you surround, yeah, there's a lot of low-level criminal behavior. There's some high-level criminal behavior, but um, how do you, bounce, well, I don't know, like, wait, 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 I just, how yeah. do you answer, well, what's the role, yeah, how should police police Skid Row in L.A.? Oof. Yeah, so I will say that, you know, and there's a part in my book where there's an encampment and there are people within the encampment saying, I asked the police to help me and, and they were taking a hands off approach. And this seems to precede new levels of violence in the camp. And so I think even if we are having a, a model where like we're, we're, te we're temporarily tolerating an encampment because we don't have anything to offer people, is there a role for police to 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 try to stop violence? I think certainly. Um yeah, I, I don't have a, I certainly don't have a kind of like uh, there should never be police contact here. Um, I think there's also in many cases, if people have had bad experiences with police, like if our first point of contact is going to be social service providers, uh, I think that in many cases that's going to be appropriate. Um, but yeah, certainly like when you have encampments that often sometimes have families, I don't think there should be open air drug markets. Uh, I think that should be should be shut down. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I, I think that yeah, we go, we tend to go for these all or nothing kind of like, oh, and then what we have to do is completely sweep everyone there away. So they're out of public view. Um, yeah, it's going to be a series of sort of compromise points like that, I think. What are sort of basic hygiene um, short term solutions, porta potties, or how do you deal with human waste? Yeah, yeah. Uh, porta potties are one option. Are they a good one? Uh, yeah, I'm not the expert on that per se. I've heard I've heard different I've heard different perspectives on that. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to have yeah, or or like they have you can they can set up these kind of shower type situations. Um, I think that can be useful. Would you? Is there any concept of yes of segregating people either by you mentioned you know families and open air drug markets? Is it crack? Is it desirable? It might not be practical, but would it even be desirable to try to separate groups of people by mental illness or drug addiction or something else? Yeah, I could see that, right? So we, we do that already with shelters where we might have like family shelters or or men's shelters or women's shelters. Um, I'm not sure precisely how we would, you know, this would be, yeah, if we, if cities were essentially saying de facto, we have our sanctioned encampments in these different zones. And yeah, and, and some of them already do have these kinds of divisions. So some that are oriented toward, towards single people. Um, actually here in San Diego, I was just trying to help someone access one of these uh, kind of like safe camping zones and they actually are, are all for adults they didn't have space for for families so i would like to see one for families alongside that if that's going to be our temporary solution um in the absence of something better um that oh, probably should wrap it up i want to check i have a couple other highlights uh from the book let me just check my notes here um how should the feed? Have you gotten any flack for not towing certain party lines in response to your book, or what's what's the reception been? You know, yeah, I'll say I, I've I've had a little bit just in terms and, and from people who I respect, some uh, who who don't like this idea of yeah, let's make better forced treatment or better asylums. Um, 
at the same time, when I've had conversations with people, you know, and I've been able to try to explain where I'm coming from, I think people see it as, or, or they're open to, they're at least open to this idea of maybe that's not our end goal, but there's, there might be a place for it. Um, I'll say I've been happy that, you know, I've gotten some engagement, you know, like reviews for like across the spectrum, like a positive review from the New Republic, but also a positive engagement from, from City Journal. And that to me makes me feel like I must be saying something uh, that's not at least total bullshit. If people from, from different sides can find something valuable, although I would say they also, they seem to highlight different parts that they liked or disliked. Hmm. But that's, I'm just thinking tactically, it's actually, you know, let them each, I, you know, cherry pick a little bit. Um, yeah. That's good because they, at least they're both reading the book and spreading it um, to a wild audience. And some of it, I think, is people just happy to, it's refreshing sometimes to hear, uh, to, 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 just to feel her like, oh, he's not dismissing my side out of hand. Um, you know, I think that's part of also the appeal of the book. Um, which again is um, sons, daughters, and sidewalk psychotics, mental illness, and homelessness in Los Angeles. Um, any other points that you want to just bring up that are that you'll feel bad if you don't say them, and you'll be like, "Oh man, I should have said that." Um, uh, um, nothing in particular. I'll just say, yeah, that you know, I was mentioning to you briefly, like you know, that I I've been teaching some of your material in this class I have called defund police and prisons question mark you know and it's interesting because the title itself already acts as a kind of rorschach like people come in either like that's a ridiculous idea these are students right they either come in that's a ridiculous idea or others come in like of course we're going to defund the police um and i've just been working really hard to try to like bring to students um yeah people from across the kind of audio ideological spectrum and and and, and contrary to you know I know sometimes I hear people say like, oh, students these days don't want to hear anything that's outside of their worldview. That hasn't been the case. I mean, it's it's been really great, you know, and I've had people, everyone from police abolitionists to someone from the Manhattan Institute, um, uh, cops, as well as as people who are trying to work outside of the system. And my students have been very open to, you know, they'll come in with whatever their political priors are, but they've been pretty open to hearing empirical arguments from different positions and then trying to work out like, okay, if that's how the world really is, how does that connect to the ideal I want to see? So I, I would say like, I've mostly been, uh, maybe there's a selection, I don't know, you know, maybe these students are different than others, but overall I'd say they that's were- what I was going to say, do you think it's because we both teach at public schools? Because I hear what you're saying. Um, and yeah, a lot of talk about kids these days. I don't, I don't know, my New York City kids are, are great in terms of their being open-minded and um, having some common sense and it might be a, maybe a public school. Um, yeah. Cause I also have two friends who teach at Columbia and this is great cause it gives both of them plausible deniability, but the <laughs> stories they tell me of the students at Columbia and just the entitlement and the privilege and the weird excuses and the, you know, grade grubbing and all that stuff. And I just go, I, I, I can't relate. Um, yeah. There's still freedom of speech in my class. There's still, you know, I've, I've never had anyone, I mean, I, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about, uh, you know, very sensitive issues of, of race, policing, crime, you know, and so on. But I don't know. Yeah, I think my students are great. So I'm glad to hear, uh, hear that from somebody else as well. Um, well, uh, thank you so much um, for your time. And um, we will stay in touch, certainly. And um, I, I'm... I'm Peter Moskos, and I'm here with Neil Gong, G-O-N-G, and the book Sons, Daughters, and Sidewalk Psychotics is um, out uh, by University of Chicago Press, and he is an assistant professor of sociology at UCSD, that's University of California, San Diego. Um, thanks so much, Neil. It's been great talking to you. Oh, yeah. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for having me.